This is Investment Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Daily live streaming interactive featuring Mrs. Backup. Subscribe, hit the notification, smash the likes. Now, here's Backup Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to Investment Perspectives, everybody. Happy June 1st. This is going to be straight fire. This is a combination of some things we have definitely talked about in different videos and live streams before. And by the way, as a side note, I'm still running through a lot of material in the documentary, so I'm going to have to postpone the live show for a few more days. We'll take it day by day. I'm getting through this stuff very, very uh, uh, quickly on the documentary, Cryptonaires, and I couldn't be more excited. It's great to revisit all of this material, but uh, I'm laying everything out all the interviews into the chapter section, and I just want to stay strong and keep the shoulder to the grindstone and move through the material so we can get it back in Mike Jansen's hands. So uh, may postpone the live show for a few more days this week. We'll see how it goes. But I'll definitely try to do a live show at least this week so we can cover a lot of this information that's been going on. All right, let's get into this because we're going to touch a lot of different things today, but it's going to take us to a very special place. Okay, a conversation we've been having here for a while. Let's start with this. The central banks firm up plans for digital currencies. Now, that is the CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currencies or Digital Dollars, right? All right, now we all are aware that this dollar project just came out with their white paper. Well, here is a great video from Darren Moore. Darren Moore Jr. on fire found this video and shout out to the lady who interviewed him because she did a great job. I do not know her name and I didn't seek out the original source yet. I didn't haven't had time, but shout out to her for an amazing interview, by the way, and shout out to Darren Moore for finding it. So love him up if you're able. Uh, all right. So this is Christopher John Carlo from the dollar found digital dollar foundation uh, and Accenture XSCFTC chairman, and also his brother Charles is on that uh, foundation as well as many others. And there is some very, very candid remarks made here. And he just got done explaining the example about remittances a grandmother in the in, in Philadelphia, as an example. Uh, has a birthday with a granddaughter in the Philippines, and she can't. She can send an email card and all of those things, but she can't send money. It takes 10 days, and they may charge her 7 to 17%. And even still, it's going through many different hands and corresponding banks on the way there. And by the time it gets there, it could be in a Philippine bank that is not insured, and then the money's not guaranteed if that money that bank were to go under. So he it just provides an excellent example there. But just for the sake of expediency, I want to get to this section. Let's listen to what he's talking about here as he moves forward listen to this very carefully in a in a in a in a, in a stable world this accounts based system has grown and grown and grown and it roughly works but it's loaded with friction it's loaded with friction what is out here that is designed to solve the walled gardens and the digital friction of the world because of the fiat friction that he's mentioning here now listen very carefully to what he says it's very expensive. And we are not calling for displacing it overnight, but we're calling for, you know, this is equivalent to if you want to build a new mass transport system, you probably don't tear down the old one. You leave it running, but you build a new one alongside it. You Uh oh. That's exactly what Victoria Cleveland, executive director from the Bank of England, said. That they build the new payment rail right next to the old payment rails and run them parallel in conjunction with one another. So if there's any problem, they can switch right back to the traditional payment rail. And he's saying the exact same thing. And wait till you hear what else he says. Using a newer technology. And that's what we're talking about. Let's start building the new rails of the new technology. We don't tear down the old one, but let's build it because it's a public good to build. Oh, a public good. Oh, I've been going on about this all the time. Now, you don't have to believe me when I say it, but you might want to start believing somebody like Christopher John Carlo, ex-CFTC chairman, now head of the Dollar Foundation, Dollar Project. That is powerful. 
He just talked about a public good. Let's hear it again. That's remarkable. In between to give somebody money. Well, maybe they do. Maybe they don't. In a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a stable world, this accounts based system has grown and grown and grown, and it roughly works. But it's loaded with friction. It's very expensive. And we are not calling for displacing it overnight. But we're calling for, you know, this is equivalent to if you want to build a new mass transport system, you probably don't tear down the old one. You leave it running, but you build a new one alongside it using a newer technology. And that's what we're talking about. Let's start building the new rails of the new technology. We don't tear down the old one, but let's build it because it's a public good to build that new system that not just our generation, but the next one, the next one will then say, God, my grandparents were so foresighted to build this new transportation system that I'm enjoying today. Public good. You know what else is a public good? And we've talked about this ad nauseum and it's time to talk about it again because Christopher John Carlos now openly talking about it the way we did. The internet is a public good. Article 19 delivered the following statement at the 35th session of the UN Human Rights Council on June 14, 2017, one year ago. Uh, it was not one year ago then, through the article it was. UN Human Rights Council reaffirmed that the same rights that people have offline must be protected online. Public good. This is something I've gone on about here quite heavily. And in order for something to really get that kind of systemic financial market utility, a SIFMU, systemically important designation, it would have to come from FSOC. Here is the FederalReserve.gov remarking on SIFMUs. Here, it talks through this, and let's just see here, where it talks about clearinghouse interpayment bank system, and they're in this particular uh, write-up here in this paper, they talk about uh, clearinghouse interbank and all of these things. Financial market utilities are the multilateral systems that provide the infrastructure for transferring, clearing, and settlement payments, securities, and other financial transactions among financial institutions or between financial institutions in the system in cases where, among other things, a failure or a disruption to the functioning of a financial market utility could create or increase the risk of significant liquidity or credit problems spreading among financial institutions or markets and thereby threaten the stability of the U.S. financial system. The financial market utility may be designated as systemically important by the Financial Stability Oversight Council, known as FSOC. This is courtesy of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Consumer Protection Act. Well, let's go another step further to FSOC. The Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is attached directly to the Treasury, and the head of it is Steve Mnuchin. Coming down into here, and this whole page is a, is a read, let me tell you something. But coming down into this information here, what we're going to touch on here is, all right, prior to the crisis, U.S. financial regulatory framework focused narrowly on individual institutions and markets, which allowed supervisory gaps to grow regulatory inconsistencies to emerge in allowing, in turn, allowing arbitrage and weakened standards. No single regulator has responsibility, responsibility for monitoring, addressing overall risk to financial stability, which too often involve different types of financial firms operating across multiple markets, leaving important parts of the system unregulated. Now, this is the job of the Dodd-Frank uh, Wall Street Reform Consumer Protection Act uh, through the creation of FSOC, the actual regulatory body itself. <clears throat> so, coming through here, um, let me move here to this particular section here. Designate non-bank financial companies for consolidated supervision, non-bank financial companies. You mean like a blockchain infrastructure company like Ripple or RippleNet, more importantly? Probably more like RippleNet, right? The group and the cloud-based services, right? In the run-up 
to the financial crisis of 08, some of the firms which posed a greater risk to the financial system were not subject to tough consolidation supervision. The Dodd-Frank Act gives the council the authority to require consolidated supervision of non-bank financial companies, regardless of their corporate form. The Dodd-Frank Act authorizes the council to designate financial market utilities that perform payment, clearing, or settlement activities as systemic, requiring them to meet prescribed risk management standards and heightened oversight by the Federal Reserve, the Securities Exchange Commission, or the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. I got to tell you, we've covered this before on this channel, but now that Christopher Giancarlo is talking about a new payment rail system that is a public good, I ask you this. This is the World Economic Forum Policymaker Toolkit. Within this, let me just scroll back a piece here, and then we'll come back to that. It talks here clearly about the fact and the advantages of DLT-based CBDC transaction verification could support greater transparency in CBDC payment processes. And then it explains this throughout the entire document, the benefits, the pros, the cons, the whole bit. However, what they also provide in here, because it's a policy maker toolkit, is the framework that they are supposed to use when they go back to their respective countries to design and build a central bank digital currency. Well, within that framework, we have this demonstration, an example of the fact that when you settle the most relevant wholesale CBDCs, the innovations in existing legacy market infrastructure, SWIFT, GPI initiative, crypto assets designed for inter- or intra-bank payments and settlement, examples JPM coin and XRP, collaboratively developed DLT-driven interbank payment systems. Well, let me tell you something. If he is referring to the new payment rails as a public good, and he being Chris Giancarlo, ex-CFTC chairman, now head of the Do Digital Dollar Foundation, we know that FSOC has the ability to designate non-bank financial companies or processes, protocols, as systemically important financial market utilities, especially when it comes to payments, clearing, and settlement activities. What are they saying here? Because I'm pretty sure they're saying <laughs> that the asset XRP, as well as JPM coin, are crypto assets designed for payments and settlements. This gets very interesting because I believe and have believed for a long time that the ILP, which by the way is the Interledger Protocol, which is not distributed ledger technology. Let's be very clear and take a look at that. The ILP is not Ripple. It is a neutral open protocol for linking ledgers and payment networks. This is a common misconception because a lot of people in the payment community have preconceived ideas about Ripple and haven't read the paper, and it was written by Ripple engineers. ILP actually has nothing to do with, nor ever mentions Ripple consensus ledger. Exactly. So when we look at that and we understand that the ILP is the interface, basically, for lack of the interface protocol, that interacts and can talk to any different DLT system or ledger of any kind. And knowing that the XRP ledger is a distributed ledger technology, I have to wonder if the ILP, which by the way, has been gifted to the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. So make no mistake about that either. The ILP has been gifted and is working with and has been built on since 2015. It was gifted by Ripple 
to the World Wide Web Consortium, which is the standards body to oversee the practices and standards of the Internet as we know it. It has been built on since 2015 by developers. It is a new protocol for the Internet of Value. The question remains now is will the decentralized ledger, more importantly should I say, decentralized exchange, XRP's decentralized exchange, which runs on the XRP ledger, will that become a public good? The first real decentralized exchange that is designated a public good at some point. Because the reality is, it certainly fits the description of a designate systemic financial market utility, systemic payments for clearing and settlement that can absolutely disrupt the financial system for good or bad. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. Shout out again to Darren Moore, who just put it up like fire. And shout out to Christopher John Carlo, who I'd love to have on this show who absolutely candidly lays out exactly what's going on. And by the way, this entire interview is amazing. And thank you to the lady who originally conducted the interview as well. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe and share this content. Let's get everybody into this conversation. It's getting bigger.